Let's go. Welcome to Afghanistan. America's longest war. There were guys now begging. Come on, I've trained my whole life for this. Contact blast, 200 meters. Dismount, small arms RPG. It's here they say that empires go to die. Oh, you almost killed me. Sometimes I long for that war where there is a clear winner. You know, most Americans think we haven't made a difference, but let's see what the future holds. These are the stories of the men and women who fight to win. Do not be afraid to squeeze that trigger. You will know when, you will know why. I'll go back and I'll do it all over again. I wouldn't take a day back. I was able to not only serve my country, I was able to walk that ground with some real heroes. Even if it's not clear what winning will mean. I fought for my men, and I fought for my country, and, and I fought to get home. Was that the plan, or? No, that wasn't the plan, sir. My interest in the Army goes back to when my dad gave me uh, the, the picture book of the Iliad and the Odyssey when I was a kid. Had I not gone into the military, I would not have been a complete person. That's not true for everyone, but that was certainly true for me. Really, the three avenues of approach they could possibly use, they're not going to use. Army Captain Adrian Bonnenberger is leading a company of 10th Mountain Division soldiers in northern Afghanistan. Due to uh, high likelihood of AP mines on the hill. Their mission today is to take this hill, a key Taliban position outside the city of Imam Sahib. I had a stud team who was telling me, there are probably going to be mines up on the hill. We got this. And I was like, roger that. Awesome. Instead. Don't move. Hey, we need a ladder. Stay here, Doc. Stay here. A member of the explosives team triggers a mine by mistake. My stomach sank. Just this awful feeling in, my, in the pit of my stomach, in my gut. All right, casualties. Is anybody OK? Who's good? I immediately, you know, was thinking, we got to get out of here. He's definitely not okay, sir. Easy, guys. He got, he got hit. Hey, sir, we're getting our medic to him. It's taking a while because of that AP mine threat. The thrill of combat is something that you look for it, and you look for it, and then one day you find it, and you're not looking for it anymore. After more than a decade of taking hills like this one and valleys and dusty rural villages, America is still looking for victory. People constantly ask me, you know, are you an optimist or a pessimist? And I would say I am a realist, and it's all hard all the time. Screaming eagle, sir. <laughs> Much better. Much better. Yes, sir. Come on. Four-star General David Petraeus meets with the troops after taking charge of the war in July 2010. Keep up the great work. Thank you, sir. There has been progress in a host of different areas, but there's also a clear recognition of how much more needs to be done, how challenging it is. What occasionally I found useful to do was to recall why we went there in the first place to ensure that Al-Qaeda could not use that again as a sanctuary to plan the next 9-11 attacks. Let's just get back. Get back. I was in school in a typewriting class, and uh, we were you know, learning how to type 50 words per minute. Class had the TVs on and just seeing the next plane come in. And I remember thinking, maybe I should do something. School immediately became trivial. All I could think about was history's happening, and I had to be a part of it. Somebody is doing this on purpose. We all felt that sense of patriotism. How dare they come to our country and execute these attacks on innocent people? Yes, that is the second, that is the second tower. That is the second tower. I wanted to stand up for my nation. I was going to give my all. And I said, OK, I'm going to war. I got my date. I'm shipping out. And here I am.
It does have the earmarks of an Osama bin Laden attack. Less than a month after 9-11, the U.S. goes on the offensive. The mission? Destroy Al-Qaeda training camps, bomb Taliban military installations, and hunt down Osama bin Laden. Max Bowers is a lieutenant colonel in the Army's Special Forces, better known as the Green Berets. Now, he and about 300 of these highly trained soldiers get their biggest assignment yet. We had engaged in uh, an unconventional warfare training exercise involving the entire battalion, but we had never undertaken an event of this type before. For longtime soldiers like Sergeant First Class Christopher Spence, it's a call to duty they've been waiting for. There were guys who had just gotten out of the unit a month before and are now begging. Come on, I've trained my whole life for this. As the Green Berets deploy, 31-year-old Spence prepares his wife and two young sons in Tennessee. I said, can't tell you where. Don't know when I'm going to come back. I, lo I love you guys. In late October, the men set up camp. At the Karshikanabad Air Base in neighboring Uzbekistan. The soldiers call it K-2. K-2 is an old Soviet Air Force base. You have to provide your own plumbing, your own power generation, your own sleeping quarters. There's nothing there. It was fairly well known that Afghanistan was a lawless haven for terrorists. We needed a secure environment from which to uh, infiltrate in Afghanistan. With its rugged terrain and long history of tribal warfare, Afghanistan has been a death trap for invading empires including Great Britain and the Soviet Union. Now, Bowers leads three Green Beret teams. They'll fight the Taliban alongside a group of Afghan rebels, known as the Northern Alliance, who have been at war with the Taliban for years. It was obvious that we needed a campaign in the North. We had to get forces in that worked with these uh, key resistance leaders. Bowers and his team chopper into Afghanistan's Darya Souf Valley, or the Valley of Caves. When we landed, it was very surrealistic. We landed in a flat river wash. We got off the helicopters, and it was game time. The next day, Bowers meets up with his new Afghan ally, General Abdul Rashid Dostum. He's a tough warlord who has switched sides several times since the Soviet-Afghan War. The Taliban forced him to flee the country in the late 90s. Now he leads an army of nearly 2,000 men, fiercely devoted to defeating them. He was a guy that, you know, while there was no nonsense about him at the same time, there was a human dynamic to him that I thought made him very likable. The Allies plot their first move, take a key northern city called mazar -e sharif where Dostum once ruled. You can never fully and absolutely trust uh, your counterpart uh, because he has his own uh, agenda, and we had to always remind them, we don't want Afghanistan. We are here to avenge what was done to us, and you are our friends, and we will do it with you. As the plan takes shape, Afghans provide the Americans with their preferred mode of transportation. I knew horses would be there, and I knew that ground mobility was extremely limited, but it was beginning to occur to me that this is the only real mobility we have. Dostum leads the men to mazar -e sharif on horseback, and Spence captures this image. We actually made some jokes about calling in airstrikes, $1.8 million, $8,000 worth of communication gear, riding horseback, running for 100 bucks, priceless. As the men approach their objective, American B-52 bombers pound nearby enemy targets. 
the time I really didn't know what to do because they, we've showed up in their backyards. We can't believe it. It was just so quick that they collapsed and began falling back. On November 10th, 2001, the Green Berets enter a liberated Mazari Sharif, the first major Afghan city to fall. It was like the liberation of France as we're rolling on through into town, knowing that the Taliban's gone. Dostum had actually offered to, he said, why don't you put up an American flag? We decided that this is their victory, not ours. We don't need American flags. The Taliban regime is crumbling. Just three days later, the country's capital, Kabul, also falls. So far, the war is going according to plan. The Taliban could not put up with that level of firepower and that level of just determination and grit that the Northern Alliance showed. In the north, the U.S. is waging an unrelenting bombing campaign on the city of Kunduz. On the outskirts, Colonel Bowers and General Dostum coordinate airstrikes with an Air Force team aboard an AC-130 gunship. Their target is a safe house, sheltering over 200 Taliban fighters. Roger, 800 meters to the northeast of Violet Smoke. Uh, we need uh, gun runs on those uh, structures, I'll copy. 28-year-old First Lieutenant Allison Black is the gunship's navigator, and the only woman among its crew of 13. I happen to have longer hair, and hopefully I smell better than they do. But I carried my weight, and I was there as the navigator to get the job done. I understand the house is hostile, and we'll move uh, down the ridge from that point. On the ground, General Dostum is intrigued when he hears a woman's voice over the radio. He tries to use it to his advantage. They were using CB radios to talk to Taliban. He held the, uh, the microphone close so that her voice could be heard. He said, America is so determined they bring their women to kill the Taliban and tried to convince them to surrender. But the Taliban are in no mood to give up. The way the, the gunship will work is we don't leave. Every time a bullet hits the ground, we're assessing and we're shifting. If the mission was to put around, at the entrance of that building. We're gonna put a round at the entrance of that building. Nice, right there. Black and her crew take out several of the enemy fighters. That's beautiful. Oh, yeah, all right, break. Dostum is so impressed, he gives Black a nickname, the Angel of Death. When he saw the C-130 gunships shooting, they thought it was a laser. There was a belief that uh, America had had this death ray and it could destroy whatever it touched. So Dawson, once he had seen that at first, he's like, hey, bring in the laser, the plane that's got the laser gun. Fire the laser. After nearly two weeks of airstrikes, Kunduz falls. Hundreds of enemy fighters surrender to General Dostum. The prisoners demand to be taken to Mazari Sharif. Dostum agrees. Now, Green Berets, including Wisconsin native Mark Mitchell, see a new problem. There was really no confinement facilities for 600 prisoners anywhere in Mazar Sharif. So, out of a list of very bad options, Kala Ijangi was the least worst option. Kala Ijangi, or House of War, is a 19th century fortress just west of Mazar Sharif. General Dostum's men herd the prisoners into the courtyard of the fortress, where two CIA agents, including 32-year-old Johnny Mike Spann, an officer from Alabama, interrogate them. Among the prisoners Spann talks to is this man, who authorities later learn is an American, John Walker Lind. As Spann and the other officer question Lind, the Al-Qaeda and Taliban fighters stage a riot in the courtyard. One of General Dostum's confidant pleaded 
for a personal meeting with me and said that there had been a, a terrible incident. Prisoners were rioting and had taken over the prison and that we needed to come quickly. The enemy fighters take refuge here in a pink house in the courtyard, about 300 yards away. Mitchell begins calling in airstrikes on the structure. Roger, uh, be advised at this time, the, uh, we're going on the uh, building that's in the center of the compound house. Uh, there are Taliban inside that. Uh, right now, we got the uh, airplanes on that target first. Over. There's really no way to predict exactly how that explosion is going to unfold, where the shrapnel is going to go. The pink house at Kala Ijangi takes a direct hit from a satellite guided bomb called a JDAM. But the Taliban and Al Qaeda forces are undeterred. That first afternoon, called in for eight JDAMs to be dropped. Seven of the eight hit within the compound. The seventh one that had a malfunction landed behind me. The errant bomb hits and severely wounds several American, British, and Afghan soldiers. That was absolutely wrong. While the U.S. suffers its first fatality of the war, when CIA agent Mike Spann is killed by the rioting prisoners. When you receive word uh, of casualties, it hits every soldier right in the heart. We don't have the luxury uh, especially in a situation like that of dwelling. It takes six days for U.S. and Afghan soldiers to put down the uprising. Just two months into the war, and the U.S. has driven the enemy from their urban strongholds and toppled the Taliban regime. We did it faster than I would have thought. Those young men on the A-teams just did a spectacular job of working with their counterparts and making sure that the conditions were set for victory. But bin Laden is still on the loose, and so are hundreds of other Al-Qaeda fighters who have regrouped near the Pakistan border here in the Shyakot Valley. The U.S. embarks on a mission to eliminate them, it's called Operation Anaconda. March 2nd, 2002. Just before dawn, Chinooks deliver more than 200 U.S. troops into the valley. So as I'm flying out, I'm just staring out this little window, and I'm watching the mountains. And I'm in awe because it, it, it literally looks like a scene from National Geographic. And you're looking down at them, and, and you're like, wow. This place is beautiful. For most US soldiers, like 21-year-old Army medic Eddie Rivera, it's their first time in combat. 18, 19, 20-year-old kids, you know, and we all have the same look, like, here we go, you know? <laughs> here we go. Every one of our generations has been called on to do something for his country. We are no different been called on to fight the war on terrorism. Every man, every woman has certain defining moments in their life. Today's one of your defining moments. It's a message that resonates deeply with a 37-year-old veteran of Desert Storm named Michael Peterson. We were the first infantry unit to be deployed, and we were happy about it, especially coming from New York. It's our city, it's our country. We're ready to fight, and we wanted to fight. U.S. strategy calls for Afghan and special forces to drive the enemy toward army blocking positions in the southeast, giving the enemy nowhere to run. As Sergeant Peterson and his eight-man mortar team reach their landing zone, they encounter heavy enemy fire. It was so intense. Like, what the heck is going on? And I can remember one of my staff sergeants said, what is that noise? And I said, it's an AK-47. Makes a distinct sound. Where's that fire coming from? It was a dogfight. We were almost eyeball to eyeball. One fighter is so close, 
Peterson gets a good look at him. The first Al-Qaeda guy I saw, he was all in blue. He looked like a witch. I mean, he had long black hair, he, and here he comes with a beard. He's running towards me, and I'm thinking, wow, this guy's insane. Peterson takes aim and fires. We can shoot quite well. We're the United States Army Infantry. I shot this guy, and he would not go down. So one of Peterson's men kills him with a grenade launcher. You talk about brave or crazy. Here they come. I mean, they, they, were, they were fanatical. You see a mortar around here, you'll see a body jump over here, and you're like, oh, man, that's crazy. Imagine that. You're thinking, like, oh, it doesn't really happen like that. It's, it's so over-the-top movie Hollywood, but it happens just like that. Shrapnel from incoming mortar rounds slices through Rivera's platoon, wounding 11 of the soldiers. Now you're hearing, Doc, Doc, we're running, and we're, and we're, we're moving patients frantically. On a nearby ridge called Hell's Halfpipe, Polish-born Staff Sergeant Andrew Rappel is in a tense cat and mouse game with an enemy fighter who's hiding in a mountainside bunker. And I noticed the guy like popping through the like a little makeshift window. So every time he pulled his head out, I tried to engage him. Then Rappel holds his fire. I was trying to get him confident, so he thinks I'm gone. Finally made a decision to squeeze the trigger. And from that point, um, never saw the guy again. Nearby. Medic Eddie Rivera's platoon is taking heavy mortar fire. You have the blood of your, your buddies on your hands and on your body. I'm trying to keep track of who's OK, who's not OK, who's worse, who, who do I need to stay by? As Rivera treats one badly injured soldier, he faces another problem. I'm trying to pick up and drag this guy who's got shrapnel all throughout his legs, in his feet, he can't walk on his own, and I'm dragging him to a location that I'm telling him is way safer, but deep down inside, I don't really know. Rivera tends to his wounded, while Sergeant Peterson and his team finally get their 120 millimeter mortar tube up and running. That thing fires so loud, and it's just so powerful. It just, it shakes the earth. As soon as the 120 opened up, everything focused on us it seemed like the entire world was shooting at us peterson's position takes a direct hit from an enemy mortar several of his men are wounded and then he runs out of mortar rounds he had nothing we were just facing the enemy um, they had more mortars than us i gotta relay something to my hire called my hire I said, hey, I've, I've got a whole bunch of wounded folks here. Where are you folks at? Command attack, over. The Army is in the thick of its first major ground campaign against Al-Qaeda. But the U.S. has badly underestimated the number of enemy forces in the Shyakot Valley. Instead of 200, soldiers face 1,000 Al-Qaeda fighters. At one point during the fight, I had a, a young private, 17 years old. He has no business being in combat. He's a kid. I can picture this now, him looking at my face. I'm like, well, Menard, what the hell are you looking at? He's like, I'm scared, Sergeant Pete. I'm like, we're all scared, just, just keep fighting. And he did, and he fought well, 17 years old. I can't imagine a 17-year-old going through that hell. And he, he did a good job. The fighting is so intense, medevacs can't get to the wounded, leaving 21-year-old medic Eddie Rivera to protect his fallen men on the battlefield. And now all I could do is lay on top of them because that's what you're trained to do. You're taught as a medic to protect your patients at all costs. You start thinking about all the people you, you didn't say bye to, because as hours pass, you start wondering if, you, if you're going to make it. Sergeant Andrew Ropel and his men are still taking heavy fire. 
When a medevac helicopter makes its way through the onslaught. When he was still hovering, the first RPG round came in and exploded nearby in the tail. And at that, that point, I was like, no way. But the helicopter escapes undamaged. Teams collect the wounded and chop her out of the valley. With the cover of night, U.S. air power helps turn the tide. After 18 hours of intense combat, the soldiers leave the valley. It was the best and worst day of my life. It was the best because we made it out. But it was the worst because there was times when you're on the battlefield thinking like, I'm not going to make it home. I had good kids. Every one of them was a good young man. They were brave. They were as brave as me. They were braver. Operation Anaconda, planned as a 72-hour campaign, rages on for two weeks. Eight Americans are killed in action. The U.S. estimates the enemy death toll at 800. Commanders believe it's a decisive victory against Al-Qaeda. The U.S. decides it will continue to fight the war with a small number of troops, what officials call, quote, a light footprint. May 1st, 2003, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld, with Afghan leader Hamid Karzai by his side, announces the end to major combat operations. At the same time, America shifts its focus to another war in Iraq, and Afghanistan takes a back seat. Afghanistan had become sort of yesterday's news. You have this discrepancy between the most important thing that's ever happened to you in your life and the fact that you had to dig to page, you know, 18 of the New York Times to find any information about Afghanistan. Craig Mullaney is a 25-year-old Army captain from Rhode Island on his first combat tour. And now we just sit back and wait for something to happen. In September 2003, Mullaney and his men are based here, a village called Shkin, on the Pakistan border. We're at the border of Afghanistan and Pakistan, and hopefully we'll get some action. The soldiers call their base the Alamo. It's all these kind of adobe mud walls and sort of low slung rooms with uneven dirt floors. It was like being in the Wild West. This mountain range right here is Pakistan. These mountains have long been a crossing point for invading forces from Pakistan. When another platoon is ambushed on a nearby ridge, Mulaney's next step is clear. Take out the infiltrators who attack his men from Pakistan. It's tricky. You don't really know where Afghanistan ends and Pakistan begins. You don't want to make a mistake and create an international incident by wandering too far inside Pakistan. As Mulaney and part of his platoon drive along rocky trails, Somebody's carrying AT4 down. the others lead the way on foot. One of the men films these scenes. Hey, they're in contact right now. Yeah. Yeah. Same guys. They want to, Alton wants to know if the rest of them come down. Woo! Get over here. One of my guys who is on foot notices several Afghans, one of whom has his hands wily coyote style on like a detonator. A US soldier opens fire on the enemy fighters. That was like we had hit a hornet's nest. And suddenly 270 degrees of muzzle flashes, rocket and mortar fire from inside Pakistan, all raining down. And I hear one of my guys has been shot. Two sniper bullets hit Private First Class Evan O'Neill of Haver Hill, Massachusetts, under his flak jacket. Evan O'Neill's father had fought in Vietnam. He was an infantryman. And 
it was such a privilege for him to be able to go and, uh, you know, fight the Taliban. As his fellow soldiers dragged the 19-year-old out of the line of fire, O'Neill is hit by another shot. The teenage soldier slips into a coma and dies. I just recall being um, just in sort of a state of shock. It was like the sound rushed out of my world. It sort of all closed down on me, and time had just, time stopped. And then it all rushed back in. of war, you know, two degrees in this direction, a centimeter that way. You think about how sort of narrow that difference is between uh, being lucky and unlucky. Most of us were lucky that day. Private O'Neill wasn't. No one coming in. Get down. Mulaney and his men moved to another fire base nearby. Woo! Damn! Right there. Where they take rocket attacks from fighters inside Afghanistan. You don't get to hit pause, and you don't get to go home. Hey, get down, Luke. Oh, right inside the base. They ultimately come to the conclusion, you know, the only way back home is to keep fighting. Yeah, hurry the hell up, let's go. Spring 2005. Into blocking position. The U.S. has been fighting in Afghanistan for three and a half years. There are 18,000 American troops on the ground. Over the last year, combat here has been less intense than in Iraq. But soldiers still face pockets of entrenched enemies along the rugged Pakistan border. Men like Ahmad Shah, better known to his followers as Commander Ismail. He operates here, in the Petch Valley. Shah exploits a devastating new weapon in Afghanistan. The IED, or Improvised Explosive Device. Like Al-Qaeda in Iraq, Shah uses them against U.S. troops. In June, a team of four Navy SEALs launch a mission to kill Shah. But instead... If you don't fight, we don't kill you. Shah and his men ambush the SEALs and record the firefight. Allah Akbar. Three of the SEALs are killed in the attack. Shah scores a second victory when one of his men shoots down a rescue helicopter headed for the SEALs. All 16 on board are killed. It's the single deadliest day for the U.S. since the start of the war. Back at his base, Marine J.J. Constant watches the video shot by Shah's men. That was kind of a, a moment where I was alone in the operations center where I knew if I were lucky enough to be able to take out any of these guys, I wasn't going to be conflicted about it afterwards. Constant is a 23-year-old second lieutenant from Chicago's South Side. Now, he and his fellow Marines have their next mission. Take out Shah's cell. Operation Whalers calls for Marines to push Shah's men from the north to the south, where Constant and his platoon will be in blocking position in the Chowke Valley. Leading the unit is Marine Corps Captain Kelly Grissom. For this seasoned warrior, engaging the enemy isn't his only concern. I had learned to appreciate the difference between the map and the real terrain. 
I used to say it's as much the enemy as anything else is the terrain. August 13th, 2005. The Marines of Fox Company are on a grueling climb into the Chow Ke Valley. It was 100 degrees when we started walking in the middle of the night. It was probably 130 degrees by the time the sun came up. Captain Grissom learns the Marines in the north have been delayed. That means the journey for his men just got longer. We got several more days of moving. So I said, I want the Marines who are not on watch to take off their body armor. I wanted to get max rest and hydration, thinking we we're going to have to do this again. Grissom's men removed their body armor. But I was actually turning up and turning around to go get Captain Grissom to have a conversation with him. And sometime after that is when all hell broke loose. It was like those things on the 4th of July that kids have, those little snap things they throw. Anybody got a big throw? They're on top of the hill! One of the Marines records this footage as he takes fire from the opposite ridge. Woo! First fire fight. I can't get up the hill. I'm on the grid. Yeah. I don't know where they're at. Sure, you're the Marines don't know it yet, but they are in a firefight with Shaw and his men. And I remember thinking, man, I'm in charge. I got to do something. So I start trying to get to the radio. And at some point in there, in that initial contact, I can hear Corman up. So already we got wounded almost immediately. One of Grissom's men runs into the line of fire to grab a 240 machine gun. All of a sudden, that 240 comes in. And as soon as that happened, we immediately got fire superiority over those guys. Grissom calls in a medevac for his wounded. Nearby, Constant sees one of his young Marines take a shot to the chest. In my mind, it's just reinforcing the fact that I'm going to kill every one of these guys. I'm going to kill everybody that ever worked with them. I want to inflict as much pain on these people as possible. This video captures an army medevac as it finally makes its way into the valley. But as it does, one of Grissom's men spots something on the opposite ridge. Pennington sees this individual pop up with a RPG. And at that second, as he made eye contact with this, this insurgent. He killed this individual right there, iron sights, no direction. The medevac is able to land and collect the wounded Marines. We just lost a helo, almost in the same area. Pennington certainly, with that one shot, saved what could have been a, a, you know, another helo, another tragedy. Close air support helps drive back the enemy. The Marines make their way out of the Chow Ke Valley. Their mission is a success. Shah's cell is decimated while Shaw himself is badly wounded and leaves the region. We did what Marines do. We located, closed with, and destroyed the enemy forces that we came in contact with. And that's our job, and Marines are good at it. As the Marines confront a resilient enemy in the Northeast, soldiers further south along the Pakistan border also face attacks. Insurgents here cross the border at will, hunting U.S. soldiers. Private Channing Moss and his platoon are assigned to patrol the border. The main objective was surveillance. Let's keep an eye on these individuals. Now, Private Moss sits in the turret on top of a truck at the rear of his platoon's convoy. Moss is a gunner. His job is to keep a close watch out for any suspicious activity. In the distance, he spots a man perched on a ridge. He's got this grin on his face, and just, it kind of was eerie to me, and I was just like, something's not right. An enemy rocket blasts through the windshield of his truck. I was like, oh, something's in me. I'm thinking it's shrapnel. Thinking I can just pull it out. But it's not shrapnel. An unexploded rocket-propelled grenade is sticking out of Moss's hips. 
You feed it, I'm holding on. Okay, you feed it, I'll just, I keep coming. Freaking apart. Well, on patrol along the Pakistan border, Private Channing Moss and his platoon are ambushed. In the attack, 23-year-old Moss is impaled through his hips by a live RPG. I remember blanking. And when I came to, I, I smelled myself smoking. A medevac helicopter reaches the ambushed platoon. When they see Moss, they know the grenade lodged inside him could go off at any second, killing everyone. They load Moss into their helicopter and fly him to an aid station 20 miles away. Pilots radio ahead to tell surgeons, including Major John O, to get ready. There was a flurry of activity inside the aid station. When the medevac arrives, Major O and his surgical team defy army protocol and bring Moss, who is like a human time bomb, into the operating room. I think the medical professional took over, and then, you know, that's why we decided to do what we weren't supposed to do. And I remember pulling in and cutting my clothes off. Doc O, he's never seen anything like it. I remember looking over at this one guy, and uh, he was like, everybody out. An explosives expert warns Major O of the danger to him and his team if the ordnance inside Moss detonates. He said we'd all be pink mist, so that's all he needed to say. As the surgery gets underway, a member of the team captures this footage of the tense operation. Okay, it's coming pretty easy. There's the belt buckle. They struggle to remove the explosive head of the RPG. You feed it, I'm holding on. Okay, you feed it, I'll just, I keep coming. Freaking apart. It's stuck, but they change position and try again. Ready? After several tense seconds. Almost there, about three more inches. They remove the grenade from Channing Moss. There we go, we're clear, we're clear. All right. With the RPG out of Moss, a weapons expert takes it outside to a secure area and detonates it. I was the loudest sound in my whole life and just relief. Like everything else, if you don't take large risks, then you don't make great gains. The grenade shattered Moss's hips and pelvis. If I could help my nation on the front line of the battlefield, I'll go back and I'll do it all over again. I wouldn't take a day back. By early 2006, the U.S. is preparing to cut troops in the South as NATO takes over in the region. But at the same time, the Taliban has used its safe havens inside Pakistan to regroup, and they're expanding their operations here in Kandahar province, where the radical group was born. U.S. and coalition troops are losing ground to this large, regenerated enemy force. Army Special Forces Major Rusty Bradley from North Carolina is on his third tour of duty in Kandahar since 2002. At that time, it was a ghost town. There was really not any Taliban presence, but they knew what they were doing, and they started pushing a lot of people and resources in there, and they kept it very quiet. It was shocking to, to come back and see that areas that we had operated freely in were now controlled by the enemy. One brash leader is driving the Taliban's latest offensive. <laughs> Mullah Dadullah Lang, a veteran of the Soviet-Afghan war, who lost his left leg in battle. He's a top lieutenant of deposed Taliban leader Mullah Omar. He ran a very aggressive intimidation campaign that proved to be incredibly successful. And very quickly, like wildfire, it spread. Mullah Dadullah Lang is not to be messed with. 26-year-old Green Beret Mike Irwin is an intelligence officer from Syracuse, New York. He's alarmed by Lang's violent tactics 
which mirror those used by Al-Qaeda in Iraq. You saw the sheer number of suicide bombers. That was the biggest, most telling fact of how the insurgency was evolving in southern Afghanistan. That tactic did not exist in Afghanistan in 03, 04, barely in 05. Lang saw clearly the psychological effect that it was having not just on our soldiers in Iraq, but on the American people. With NATO now in command of forces in the south, Lang is amassing his own army capable of taking on the coalition. 40-year-old Lieutenant Colonel Omer Lavoie leads two battle companies in Kandahar province. We knew there was concentration of enemy in there, but there was no indication up to that point the numbers were as great as what materialized. Lavoie's companies will be on the front lines of NATO's first ever ground campaign, Operation Medusa. More than 1,400 coalition troops will lead the main assault. They'll move southwest through Kandahar's Panjwai Valley. Their mission is to establish a position here, on the Argandab River, across from a cluster of villages. Their target, this white schoolhouse, a key Taliban fighting position. The stakes are huge. The commander of NATO took me aside and said, uh, Omer, if um, Medusa fails, NATO fails. And I said, OK, thanks. Uh, <laughs> thanks for that. Uh, no pressure there. September 3rd, 2006, midnight. After a day of coalition airstrikes, enemy fire tapers off. Lavoie gets the order to advance his men across the Argandab River two days ahead of schedule. I'd, um, as diplomatically as possible, suggest so yes, that wasn't probably a good idea. There were a bunch of factors that take a bit of planning. In the end, uh, orders were orders. Lavoie's men cross the river at dawn. It's quiet. Until... NATO troops are locked in a fierce firefight in the epicenter of southern Afghanistan's insurgency. <laughs> Canadian commander Omer Lavoie and his men try to advance on this white schoolhouse. But Taliban forces attack from surrounding mud huts and marijuana fields. They were masterful at, at camouflaging movement, camouflaging their fighting positions. This footage captures Canadian soldiers as they encounter heavy fire. Contact blast, 200 meters. Dismount, small arms RPG. Oh, my, whoa, whoa, whoa. And I lost uh, four soldiers killed almost within the first minutes of the attack and a number of soldiers wounded. Hey, 1-1, one, one. we are in a trouble here. Nearby, U.S. Special Forces get word that the Canadians are in trouble. We're here in the severity of the fire, and we start hearing about the casualties. We're their partners. We knew they'd come get us if we ever got in trouble. Holy Operation Medusa's main force is on the ropes. Rusty Bradley and his team know they have to act fast. If they wanted to fight, by God, they were going to get one. Oh, my God, this is After several hours of intense combat, the Canadians are taking heavy casualties, so they retreat. Close your hatches! I had uh, a number of guys who needed uh, medical attention right away. It just seemed pointless to continue to reinforce a position when we were going in blind. We knew that the Canadians would eventually press the attack again, and we wanted to be in a position to support them. Bradley and his men come up with a plan. They'll take a tall hill overlooking the white schoolhouse. We could put a small element on top of the hill and 
start dropping close air support on any structures that we were taking fire from. In addition to his team, Bradley commands 60 Afghan National Army or ANA troops. Since 2003, Afghan soldiers have fought alongside U.S. and NATO forces. American officials have questioned their reliability. But Bradley is confident the Afghans are up to the challenge. What I told them was, the enemy of your country has returned, and it's going to be a very dangerous mission. What do you want to be? Do you want to be lions, or do you want to be sheep? And they were like, we want to be lions. The U.S. Special Forces jump into the fray. We didn't realize what kind of enemy force was there until we essentially drove into a three-sided ambush. 25 mil! The Americans try to hold their ground. This is one Bravo. Amber on ammo, green on water. How copy, over. But like the Canadians, they're getting hammered. So we had to give the order to break contact, get away from the enemy. And I'd never done that before. But it was the right thing to do. It was the smart thing to do. And we knew that we had to. It's a wonder we didn't get killed. Cover fire. Go, go. Just to the northeast of Bradley's position, Colonel Lavoie is once again preparing his men to cross the Argandab River. They're hit by friendly fire from an American A-10 fighter jet, seriously wounding more than 30 Canadian soldiers. That pilot, he came on the air to me right away and, and had he said he made a mistake. I'm going to still keep flying for you. And I said, yeah, I need to keep flying because I need that, that air support. Over the next day, coalition forces retreat and try to regroup. After we got back, I started looking at my truck, and the truck was shot to pieces. And that was kind of when I realized the position that we were really in, and that was the smart decision to make. Live to fight another day, and then you can take it back to them. Just over a week into Operation Medusa, Are we ready to do this thing? Yeah. coalition forces have taken a beating on multiple fronts, but they've also killed scores of enemy fighters. No, eight was that. <laughs> Rusty Bradley and his men go back on the offensive. And this time, they have help from above. We're on final now. A request clears to fire. They get behind something now. We got air burst 200 meters from. Here it comes. Yeah! Romeo, level the building. Okay, understand. The Apaches are mopping up right now. U.S. Major Rusty Bradley calls in airstrikes on enemy positions allowing his men to advance on a hill in Kandahar province. When you're bringing that kind of firepower to bear, there's really not many people that can stand up to it. The Canadian troops make their final push. I'm going to thrust a 1,000-man battle group attack from the north, hit them with everything we have. We broke the back of the Taliban that were in that area. My commander had given me eight or nine days to take the area uh, over from the Taliban, and we did it in about three days. Operation Medusa is a success. More than 500 Taliban fighters are dead. But the cost is high. 19 Canadian soldiers are killed in action. Within a month, this piece of Kandahar province comes back to life. The school was operating. There was a medical clinic. We started creating projects to hire the young men so that they had an option other than taking shots at us or putting bombs on the ground. Less than a year later, Taliban commander Mullah Dadullah Lang is killed in a night raid by American and NATO forces. Lang's death is a major blow, 
But the Taliban isn't giving up in Kandahar. And neither is the tough insurgency in the Northeast. I never made the decision to really join the military. I just sort of did it. It wasn't like for family, honor, country, nothing like that. It was just for a bored guy living in a town that had 2,000 people, and I wanted to get out of that town. Wow, I'm going really low. Go higher. I wish it was for, you know, something bigger than just because I was bored, but it, it was because I was bored completely. Hey, money, you good? <laughs> 23-year-old Brendan O'Byrne is an army sergeant from the small town of Milford, Pennsylvania. Uh, pushing up. Throughout his deployment, he wears a helmet camera, capturing moments such as this, when an Afghan soldier is shot by an enemy sniper. Hey, get the medic! Hey. What happened? Medic! What's going on? What's going on? You got shot in the bank. Hey, you, 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 you! Hey, tell him! Help me pull him out! Okay? Let's go! What's up? In the fall of 2007, O'Byrne is stationed here, the Korangal Valley, in the northeastern province of Kunar. It's known as the Cradle of Jihad. Back in the 1980s, locals here were among the first to join Arab Mujahideen to fight the Soviets. Now, U.S. soldiers are here to work with local villagers and target the foreign insurgents who live among them. But the Korangal has been one of the deadliest spots for U.S. troops in all of Afghanistan. The first three months that we were there, uh, we, we got shot at every single day, multiple times a day. Hey, did you see him? No, I don't see him. I never saw the enemy close up, face to face. And that was really frustrating because you, you're just fighting trees. You're fighting mountains. Like, how do you fight a mountain? When one of O'Byrne's buddies is ambushed and killed early in their 15-month tour, the men name their outpost in his honor, Restrepo. When Restrepo was killed, I wanted them all dead. I am the law! I didn't want anyone to kill such a good person like Restrepo to, to live. Hey, Terp. Hey, just tell him he's going to be leading out to the guy's house. O'Byrne and his platoon try to gather information from the villagers about the insurgents who routinely attack them. We're down here at the mosque uh, searching for more guys. But most of the locals are not interested in cooperating with the Americans. Hey, he's trustworthy? That guy trustworthy? I don't trust You don't trust that guy? It's very hard to say who the enemy is and who isn't. You're hanging out with this guy, and, and he's talking to you politely, but your gut feeling is that he's just bad. And nine out of ten times, he is. In October, Battle Company launches Operation Rock Avalanche targeting a village known to harbor insurgents. When a U.S. gunship destroys an enemy encampment, the soldiers learn several innocents, including women and children, are wounded, and that five more are killed. The Americans try to make amends, evacuating the wounded for care. But over their radios, they learn the angry villagers have decided to side with the insurgents who are plotting a revenge attack. Wildcat 1, Wildcat 1, this is 2-6, over. The enemy's pushed up on the high ground to my southwest. Four days after the operation, Sergeant Larry Rugel, whose call sign is Wildcat, and two other scouts are on a mission hunting insurgents. When Taliban fighters attack. Where the is that coming from? Elizabeth Rubin, an embedded New York Times reporter, captures these scenes. Go right and they push Wildcat over the hill. Yes, we're swapping. Did they take off with? 
25-year-old Rugel is killed in the ambush, and the two other men are badly wounded. For Iowa native Sal Junta, it's a harrowing loss. Sergeant Rugel was smart, he's tactically proficient, and to hear that someone of his caliber was overran and was killed, that hurts a lot. Two days later, Junta and his 18-man unit are returning from patrol. They reach a ridgeline close to where Rugel was killed. It was like one, one shot was fired really close. Not even a second later, a fraction of a second. Thousands of bullets were shot. Our world was exploding around us. Junta and his unit find themselves in the middle of an L-shaped ambush. I've never before that moment seen that amount of bullets in the air at one time. It was insanely close. Junta sees one of his buddies hit and runs through a wall of bullets to save him. I saw his head twitch and he fell over. I just go up, grab him. And as I started pulling him back, he was catching himself, getting back up to his feet, and, and came back with us. Then he notices another one of his men is missing. Two enemy fighters are carrying off one of Junta's fellow soldiers, 22-year-old Sergeant Joshua Brennan. I did the only thing I could think of, which was to eliminate the bad guys. Junta kills one of the fighters. The other runs away. He grabs a badly wounded Brennan. He was shot maybe eight times. He was missing a large piece of his mouth. I just grabbed a hold of him and just turned around and took off running back the way that I had come. Brennan and another soldier die of their wounds. Brennan was smarter than me, faster than me, and stronger than me. There's a feeling you can't shake after that. You know, you kind of want to live every second of every day because your days might be a lot fewer than you expect. 2007. America has been at war in Afghanistan for nearly six years. But the insurgency in the South continues to grow. When 82nd Airborne Lieutenant Colonel Brian Menez and his men arrive in Southern Afghanistan, they find the Taliban has established a new stronghold. When we started entering into the operation with Hellman, what we saw was a command and control nexus that was really up in Musakala. Situated in the northern part of Helmand province, Musakala is a city of 20,000 people. Musakala was their model town, and that's what they wanted the rest of Afghanistan to look like. Now, U.S. and NATO commanders decide the only way to take back Musakala is by force. I remember guys were like, I'm ready to go to Musakala. Let's get it done and take it back. December 8th, 2007. Under cover of darkness, Chinooks fly soldiers of the U.S. Army's 82nd Airborne to their landing zone. Sergeants First Class James Brasher and Ronald Strickland, along with the men of Alpha Company, immediately capture a cell phone tower on a hill overlooking Musakala. The enemy probably just didn't realize where we were. But as soon as the sun started coming up, though, that's when they started shooting at us. I remember looking down, and I could see families fleeing, you know, to the north. And I was like, we better back up, because we're about to get shot. Brasher, a 28-year-old from New Mexico, All right, go pushes down the hill with his team and enters one of the mud-walled structures. Suddenly, two Taliban fighters appear from around a corner. And I shot one with one round, but I didn't kill him. Then, Brasher's weapon jams, and one of his fellow soldiers finishes the job. And the other guy, once he saw that happen, he started taking off in the opposite direction. Brasher and his team move further into the compound when he spots another enemy fighter in a doorway. And I just picked up my rifle and started shooting into an open doorway. 
I felt a, a hard slap to my arm, and I was rocked back. And for a moment, there was nothing. Brasher's right arm is shredded. It cut my bicep in half. It broke the bone. It severed the radial nerve. It hurt like hell. The fighting for Musakala lasts for two more days before the Taliban gives up control of the last major city in their grip. Afghan National Army troops roll into town and raise their country's flag. After nearly a year of crushing Taliban rule, Musakala bounces back. And all of a sudden, the bazaar is vibrant. The people were willing to come forward and, and, and speak with us. So I was optimistic about that. I saw the gains that have been made. Little girls going to school. I saw more people with electricity. Just the small things, you know, that people kind of overlook. While U.S. forces make slow progress in Helmand, soldiers in the Northeast are struggling to hold their narrow slivers of territory. Army Sergeant David Zwick has served in both Iraq and Afghanistan. In July 2008, he's based just north of the Korangal Valley, here in the village of Wanad. Zwick fears the position of their base leaves his men dangerously exposed. The whole ground was horrible. We were at the bottom of a fishbowl. But my biggest apprehension was the enemy knew we were coming. They knew that we were going to put a base in there. Sharing Zwick's concern is 24-year-old Lieutenant Jonathan Brostrom from Hawaii. He always had a smile on his face, young, cocky guy, thought he could, you know, man muscle his way through everything, um, which I loved. With just two weeks to go in their deployment. I just want everybody to know how hot it is here right now. The men of Chosen Company work long hours in the heat to fortify their outpost. One of the men films their work. We started out with just a very, very small hole. But uh, as you can see, it has progressed to this wondrous work of art. When I was used to seeing us come up there early in the morning, now we're digging. So now they know that we're here to stay. Why do we have to build a big ass hole? Well, because these see these people up here? They want to shoot at us. There's one of the Death Mountains. Huh. Of course, that one way up there probably not going to help either. Great, so we are definitely going to die before we go home. Word. Yeah. July 13th, 2008. Everybody's getting in their positions. I start walking over to the mortar pit to begin my rounds, and the first gunfire burst. Go I don't know! More than 100 enemy soldiers attack Chosen Company from multiple positions. They were in the town firing. They were up in that high ground. They were on the ridge behind us. We're now in a 360 degree fight. The men call in air support. Five zero meters east of that green smoke. Need you to come in hot immediately. Roger, they're at the right. Apache attack helicopters. Engaging. Pound enemy positions in the village. As the battle rages, Zwick finds the lifeless body of Jonathan Brostrom. I go over to him and, you know, roll him over. And uh, Lieutenant Brostrom, whenever he was doing something, uh, he always had his mouth open. And we always made fun of him, called him mouth breather, you know. And I would just come by and hit his chin up. Close your mouth, you look stupid. But when I rolled him over, his, uh, you know, his mouth was open. I reached down, closed it, and said, you know, I got you, buddy. I'll get you home. And I stayed right there. Um, the fire intensified again, and um, I was wounded protecting his body. I wasn't going to move. Nine U.S. soldiers are killed at Winnat, including Lieutenant Jonathan Brostrom. Within days, the Army closes the Winnat outpost. The guys around me, they were mad because they felt they had given that blood for the area, but I knew that wasn't the case. Not once, in one minute of time over there, did I ever fight for any piece of Afghanistan. I didn't fight for them. I fought for my men. 
and I fought for my country, and, and I fought to get home. After more than seven years of war in Afghanistan, the U.S. gets a new commander-in-chief, President Barack Obama. He conducts a review of U.S. strategy and shifts the focus from remote outposts in the Northeast to the more populated South, where the insurgency continues to fester, thanks in part to its sanctuaries in Pakistan. May 19, 2009. More than 200 American and Afghan commandos launch a daring pre-dawn strike. Their target, an open-air drug market in the district of Marja in central Helmand province. When U.S. forces enter the bazaar, they expect fierce resistance. But it's quiet. Sergeant First Class Mark Holbert is unnerved by the lack of enemy fire. His interpreter tells him why. He said at the end of the prayer call, the, the mullah requested all fighters to come to the bazaar. He was doing a call out for all the fighters to come down, that the Americans were here. Yeah. Suddenly, the calm disappears in a barrage of gunfire and mortar rounds. U.S. Special Forces are taking heavy fire during a raid in central Helmand province. I'm coming up next to you, bub. The operation aims to take out a drug bazaar in Marja, a rural area under Taliban control for nearly a year. One of the mission planners is Army Captain Mike Irwin, an intelligence officer on his second tour in Afghanistan. He's watched the insurgency thrive with the money it makes in the country's booming opium business. That was very clear to us that Marja meant a lot to both the insurgency and the narcotics world. If we want to get at the heart of the insurgency, we have to get at their pocketbooks. When 27-year-old Staff Sergeant Dan Hartman and the other soldiers launch their attack, the enemy fires on them from well-hidden positions just outside the bazaar. You're being shot at, bolts are hitting around you, but the fact that you can't always effectively return fire, you can't see the enemy, that can be frustrating. This video of the raid shows soldiers searching stalls in the bazaar during lulls in the fighting. Faces are blacked out to protect the identities of the men. We basically went around with a pair of bolt cutters and started rolling up these rollaway doors, and we found more drugs than we were even expecting. DEA agents on the team estimate the street value at more than $4 million. I think the biggest message here was the psychological effect that this took on the insurgency. They had thought that they were infallible in Marja. We took money out of their hands and we took weapons off the streets. It's a major score against the Taliban. But the insurgency across Afghanistan refuses to die. Son of a Man, they just lit us the U.S. commanders are still eager for victory, even if it's no longer all that clear what winning in Afghanistan means. Since the start of the war, the U.S. has fought with a light footprint of troops. But it's not enough to destroy the enemy, which uses neighboring Pakistan as a safe haven to replenish its fighters. In December 2009, President Obama takes a page out of the Iraq War playbook and denounces a troop surge. Clear as many compounds as possible and push up. He sends an additional 30,000 troops to Afghanistan. Their mission, clear and hold more territory, while also rebuilding a country torn apart by decades of war. Sergeant Dennis Dare is among 4,000 Marines sent to Marja the first wave of the surge. So many Marines before me have gone into battle and been the first somewhere, and, and me knowing now that I'm gonna be part of that legacy, it was exciting. February 2010. Dare's platoon creeps towards its fighting position near the canals north of Marja. 
He just knew that this was a bad place and uh, a lot of bad things were coming. The mission to clear Marja is America's biggest offensive of the war. For years, U.S. and NATO forces have battled the Taliban in towns throughout Helmand province. It's like a balloon. Every time you squeeze it, the air goes into another spot. So it's just a matter of keep squeezing. Marine Lieutenant Colonel Brian Christmas commands five companies tasked with clearing out the enemy. Is that they could go. We knew that uh, up front it would be a very kinetic, uh, very involved fight. As the Marines push into Marja, they encounter fierce resistance. Fighters attack the Marines from camouflage positions. They were taking fire from three different sides, and it made things very tough. These guys were the real deal. That was the enemy's opportunity to blacken the eye and see what our resolve was. And, uh, and so they threw everything at us. Dare is nearly hit twice by RPGs and has to shoot his way out of an ambush. Get that gun team up here, we go. For which he earns a bronze star. Stefan Durr earned that award for probably on more than one occasion, as did probably, you know, more Marines than I can count. I do remember telling myself that uh, if I live through this thing, uh, I'm gonna get out. The only time I ever wanna carry a gun anymore is when I go hunting. After 12 days of non-stop fighting, commanders declare an end to combat. But there is no clear-cut victory. Get better essay on where the fire came from. The fighting continues for nearly a year. Keep your eyes up. If you see a puzzle flash in there, let me know where it's at. And the soldiers struggle to persuade the Afghan civilians to abandon the Taliban. If you're going to be successful in any counterinsurgency, it takes time and patience. You have to build the trust of the people. It just doesn't come because you have a big stick. Another day, man. Another day. While the Marines try to build trust among Afghans in the South. Hey, when you get up here, How do get up, up there? here. In the North, the men of the Army's 10th Mountain Division find themselves in an area once thought to be free from Taliban influence. Kunduz province is home to a hodgepodge of farming villages in the country's breadbasket. 33-year-old Captain Adrian Bonnenberger from Connecticut leads a company of 150 men. Suddenly in 2009, 2010, there's this realization that, oh, something's going on up there. Like this, the Taliban is up there. We just haven't heard about it. During his deployment, Staff Sergeant Ryan Blum and another soldier in his squad obtain a helmet cam to record their experiences. After our first firefight, there was so much going on. There was no way that we could not document this. We were doing stuff that we wanted to remember the rest of our lives. Hey, watch the left! We're just gonna steadily peel as they clear and follow up. In September 2010, the soldier's camera is rolling when Bonnenberger and his men move to secure this key enemy position so that Kunduz province can safely hold elections. Right about there, bro. In previous elections, the Taliban had shot rockets at Imam Sahib City from that hill. So we needed to, for a couple of days, deny the enemy use of that hill. Bonnenberger sends a Navy explosives team up the hill to clear it of mines. 3 2 three, seven. Send it. Send it. Yeah. Don't move! Kenny, what situation? I don't know. I'm not moving anywhere. Bonnenberger learns that the Navy's tools designed to detect metal mines are of no use. The mines on the hill are made of plastic. I did not have that key piece of information prior to going to the hill. Uh, obviously, with different information, I would have made different decisions. Their detectors didn't pick up that mine. Nope. Looks like we're leaving, guys. The soldiers begin moving off the hill by slowly retracing their steps. Tourniquet! Tourniquet! 
Father, we're coming. You're right, Hank. Medics worked to stabilize 21-year-old Army Specialist Matthew Hayes after he stepped on a mine. Sergeant First Class Dean Lee jokes with him. What do you want the store to be? Okay? Want to be a landmine or want to be an RPG? We need to get our story straight now for the chicks back home. Sergeant Lee, I mean, you talk about heroes. A guy who willingly goes into a minefield a number of times. Being an RPG uh, sound more bad, uh, man. Uh, Why you was running in the Personally, something I was very angry and frustrated and felt helpless. And... Hey, listen, if you are not absolutely essential up here, get your off this hill. But you can't allow yourself to feel at a time like that, or you will lose all sense of reality. You'll just completely break down as an effective participating member of a team. Bonnenberger's men make it off the hill without taking additional casualties. Army Specialist Hayes loses his right leg. No, get out of yeah. here, man. Uh, I hear you. But survives. And the provincial elections are a success. As the war enters its ninth year, many U.S. troops struggle to make sense of why they're still in Afghanistan. Hey, Seeing Hayes with his leg blown off really destroyed, like, why, why are we here? Why are we trying to help these people? In the summer of 2010, four-star General David Petraeus takes over command of America's longest war. He's credited with turning the tide in Iraq, but he knows Afghanistan poses very unique challenges. Because of the lack of muscle memory of a central government, limited infrastructure, the literacy rates are high, it's surrounded by various sanctuaries for some of the insurgent elements that are causing such problems for them. So nothing is easy. General Petraeus focuses on stopping the Taliban's momentum while also preparing Afghan forces to stand on their own. There's a formal transition process to enable the Afghans over time to be able to secure their territory sufficiently. But there's also an informal one, where as local leaders show the ability to stand up more, we recede a bit and they take on more of the responsibilities. During his command, Petraeus oversees efforts to rebuild civilian life. Are you gonna go to school tomorrow? In the spring of 2011, 33-year-old Captain Rebecca Murga from Chicago deploys with the Army's Cultural Support Program. Tell them we're very excited to start getting out and talking to the women. An avid videographer, she documents the soldiers' work bringing health care and training to Afghan women and children. If we can make that family stronger, that ultimately will make that village stronger, and that's really what's gonna enable Afghanistan to sustain itself. They engaged that 50% of the population in a very conservative society that was otherwise out of contact with uh, the bulk of our troopers. Afghans, they want very basic things. They want to be able to live in peace. By the end of General Petraeus' command later that year, the surge forces see progress in the south and enemy attacks are down. Of course, now we're going to start transitioning further. Afghan forces will indeed grow more than our forces draw down. We have our feet solidly on the ground, but it has a long way to go without question. May 2nd, 2011, after a nearly decade-long manhunt, SEAL Team 6 storms Osama bin Laden's Pakistan hideout, killing the leader of Al-Qaeda. Captain Adrian Bonnenberger is just back stateside when he gets the news. I was sleeping, and um, one of my roommates said, hey, man, they, they got bin Laden. And, uh, and I went back to sleep. <laughs> I didn't believe him. I saw it on the front cover of the electronic, you know, edition of the New York Times. I was like, oh my God, we, we got bin Laden, wow. I was really happy because in a certain sense, that's, that, that closes the door, you know. 
The following month, President Obama announces an end date for all conventional forces in Afghanistan. For some soldiers, it's a welcome decision. My immediate gut reaction is uh, about time. We went in there to get rid of the Taliban government, um, and we did that. We have cleared the area of training terrorists to come overseas and attack. We cleared that out. For others, the drawdown comes too soon. You got to look at what we walked into 10 years ago. No girls going to school, no electricity, no nothing. And now, you know, look at the gains over there. I think more time would be more progress. After conventional U.S. troops leave, small teams of special forces plan to stay behind to train and guide the Afghan security fighters. These fledgling troops will be all that stands between Afghanistan and the terrorist groups that want to take it back. We're going to make sure that our Afghan partners are set up for success and then let them succeed. There it is, guys. Take over. It's yours. But in 2012, the tensions between U.S. soldiers and their Afghan partners are on the rise. I mean, uh, Bailey, yes. take your team this way. What the f Are you okay, serious? I'll shoot you. Over the last five years, Afghan security forces have turned their weapons on their U.S. and NATO counterparts, killing more than 70. No! You almost killed me! In March 2012, a U.S. soldier, Army Staff Sergeant Robert Bales, is accused of killing 17 villagers near Kandahar, mostly women and children. One year after the raid that killed bin Laden, President Obama makes a surprise visit to Afghanistan, where he praises the troops. Time and again, they have answered the call to serve in distant and dangerous places. In an age when so many institutions have come up short, these Americans stood tall. They met their responsibilities to one another and to the flag they serve under. But with the final outcome still uncertain, the men and women who served struggle to make sense of it all. In combat, when you kill someone, it's like scoring a touchdown in football. Unfortunately, that's, that's the, the victory. Ha ha ha, I, I shot you, stuff. you bastard. And that's one of the biggest things that has screwed me up the most in my life, is the idea that I was cheering when someone died. It's life-changing to serve, uh, to serve overseas at war. You come home, it's an incredible culture shock to be back and see people mowing their lawns and going to the grocery store after a period in which, you know, your every action has you know, big consequences. Woo, look at that. For many, the war forged the strongest bonds they'll ever know. I was able to not only serve my country, but I was able to walk that ground with some, with some real heroes. And I'll spend the rest of my life wishing I was still on patrol and walking that ground with those guys again. It doesn't matter what branch of the military you served in. If, if you served with me or any of my brothers in combat, you're one of us. Others still want to know what a straightforward victory feels like. Sometimes I long for, for that war where there is a clear winner. As a soldier, you go over there, you do the best that you can. You hope that it, it meant something in the big scheme of things. But realistically, you come home and, and you have to wonder if maybe, maybe it didn't.